Hello, everyone. How is everybody doing? Great. Good. How are you? Good. Good. Doing wonderful. Good. Good. Everybody's good. All right. I uh, appreciate everybody's time. We will start here shortly. Uh, we still have folks joining us. Dr. Du, should we call you Pastor Du tonight? I like the outfit. <laughs> uh, why is that? If I may ask. All you need is the white collar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he goes over all the all my yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. So I hope everybody had a great week so far. Uh, at least it's Friday is the weekend, uh, so it's good. So tonight we have an interesting discussion uh, still on AI uh, and we'll be looking at machine learning and how it is impacting the tools we use in cybersecurity, right? So uh, when we have a panelist, a uh, group of cybersecurity professionals from within the Arrhythmus uh, Academy or the, the Arrhythmus family uh, who will be, you know, giving us all their insights uh, into the cybersecurity tools that they use uh, and how AI is playing a role in that, right? So uh, we are going to start time now and uh, as folks are joining, we will let them in accordingly. All right, everyone, uh, good evening and welcome to the Arrhythmia Cyber Chats. Uh, we do this every Friday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and we welcome everybody that's open to uh, anybody who wants to uh, be part of this chat and learn more about cybersecurity. And uh, aspiring and uh, cybersecurity professionals are all welcome to partake. Uh, if you are new to the Arrhythmia family, you are welcome. We are a big cybersecurity family. Uh, and we embrace and encourage everybody to take part in our discussions. And if you have any questions, uh, any concerns, you can bring it up. And we are here to help. Uh, and this community is very supportive. So if you are new, uh, we have a WhatsApp group that we are going to post in here for anybody who is interested to join. I think we are almost like uh, 700 or 650 about, right? And very supportive group. If you have any problems, issues, concerns, you can always put it in there. And every program that we are organizing, we also post it in there. So you have the opportunity of uh, knowing what we are doing and be part of it, right? So uh, everybody, you are welcome once again. Like I always say, Friday night, you could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here with us. So we are also going to make sure uh, your time is not wasted and you are going to gain something out of this uh, conversation that we have. So uh, whilst we're waiting for our panelists to all join, I think some of them got off work late. So we are going to start with some background into uh, AI and machine learning. I know this is not the first time uh, we are looking at AI. We looked at chat uh, GPT, and we are going to look at other aspects of AI as we use it now. So welcome once again. This is Cyber Chat. We are starting time now. So you are also welcome. This is uh, brought to you by Erasmus Academy, a cybersecurity uh, training institute based in New York. Uh, we, we do all our training virtually or remotely. And uh, I'm going to be your uh, instructor presenter for this. Uh, I'm Dr. Emmanuel Edu, for those of you who might not be familiar with me. Uh, I'm a United States, a former United States Army captain. Uh, I'm the founder of Arrhythmus Inc. and Arrhythmus Academy. Uh, I'm the CEO of Arrhythmus Inc., which is the QSA company or a, a cybersecurity consultant company. We specialize in PCI, uh, DSS assessments and audits. So we are auditors if you want to look at it that way. And we also do PCI uh, cybersecurity consulting uh, in all you know other aspects of cybersecurity. Now, uh, I've also I love to teach. Obviously, uh, I taught at University of Maryland Global Campus and CTC Central Texas Com uh, College, and uh, some of my certifications are what is on here. So, uh, if you need help, you need to talk to me. I'm very reachable, uh, easy to reach. 
uh, the numbers was going to be posted in there. You can, you know, we can talk offline. So today's topic, we are looking at some of the most powerful uh, cybersecurity, AI, and machine learning tools. But before we jump into the tools themselves, uh, there is a whole variety of them. Uh, we are going to look at uh, AI and machine learning as it's uh, and its effects on cybersecurity. Uh, so. This is going to be a very interesting topic. Uh, we are going to leave the floor for everybody to also contribute uh, as we move along. So before we start, we like we normally do, uh, I think for the past month or two months now, uh, we will look at some cyber news for the week, and then we will jump into uh, introduction into AI and machine learning, and then we'll look at why you know it is needed in cybersecurity and some of the use cases. And then we also look at some of the benefits of using AI and we look at some of the tools, the most useful tools or the most powerful ones. And then our panelists are also going to, you know, chime in and add to it. And everybody will be invited to also, you know, uh, add the experience with AI as, uh, you know, it pertains to the cyber security side. Okay. So uh, with cyber news, we are looking at the first news that we are looking at uh, is a vulnerability uh, with the CVE number uh, 2019-18935. And uh, this vulnerability affects or uh, that this uh, uh, attack or like this uh, vulnerability that attackers are using to exploit uh, systems, uh, it affected a government agency, uh, their IIS server. And uh, the software that has this vulnerability is uh, Telerik. And uh, so Telerik, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is one of the uh, platforms out there that you we use for uh, software development, uh, mobile uh, app development, right? So uh, a government agency uh, is using that, and there is a vulnerability that was found way back 2019. I'm not sure why the government agency uh, still has this on their servers without you know patches being installed, and uh, attackers were able to uh, get their way, or they were able to bridge. Uh, a government agency system using this vulnerability. And uh, obviously for government agencies, for somebody to breach them, uh, it's not gonna be a script kitty. Uh, if we are looking at the types of hackers, this is obviously gonna be an advanced persistent threat uh, actor. So an advanced persistent threat actor is uh, one of the sophisticated groups of hackers uh, who, are, who have a lot of resources and uh, a, a, a lot of, uh, money you know, skills, right? And mostly they are sponsored by uh, governments or big corporations, and they are the ones who perpetrated this. And the name of the like the actual APT uh, is not known yet, but some uh, other traits of uh, some group uh, hacking group called XE Group was found uh, on these systems that were that were breached, right? So, uh, but you know, nobody has really claimed uh, this attack, uh, anybody from the list of APTs that are well known now. So, uh, and this was detected by FBI, CISA, MS, uh, I, uh, ISAC, uh, and it was detected that since between November 2022 and I think January 2023, uh, these attackers were able to Get onto the government net, uh, or get onto this uh, government agency as uh, network, and they just stayed on there right until uh, they were detected, right? But this uh, vulnerability is not a zero day vulnerability; it's a vulnerability that was found 2019. So mostly with the CVE labeling, uh, if you are not familiar with the CVE labeling, every vulnerability, every known vulnerability has, uh, let's say, a serial number that we use to track these vulnerabilities and. All known vulnerabilities can be found uh, in the National Vulnerability Database that is kept by the United States government uh, under NIST. So is the uh, NVD, so National Vulnerability Database. All known vulnerabilities are there, so uh, you can go there and check this out. Uh, and also, uh, you can use that to do vulnerability research and find out uh, what solutions uh, or uh, what measures and uh, that we can put in place to help mitigate this. But obviously, uh, with such vulnerabilities, a patch from the software owner, uh, so Telerik, uh, Rick, in this instance, uh, will be enough 
to solve this problem, right? So this is not a zero day vulnerability, uh, it's a vulnerability with a solution. So uh, if you allow yourself to be breached using such a vulnerability, then you know uh, I think you have yourself to blame, right? So this is something in the news, uh, the government uh, kind of, the government agency dropped the ball on this one. So now let's also look at Logbytes uh, 3.0. So Logbytes in the news again, and for those of you who are not familiar with Logbytes, uh, it's one of the ransomware attacks uh, that attackers have been perpetuating for a while now. I think, I'm not really sure when it came. I think 2019 or 18 is when uh, they surfaced on the attacks uh, space. And now they have it as uh, uh, ransomware as a service. So there are uh, malicious people who are developing this malware and they are uh, selling it as a service to other attackers to use, right? So uh, they have really, you know, well organized. So attackers are using it like how you use Zoom or you use any other software. So people are, you know, they are subscribing or buying license to uh, a software that they are going to use to hack uh, companies, right? So they have a new version uh, or a newer version of Logbytes. It's Logbyte 3.0. And uh, government agencies, FBI, uh, CISA, and MSISAC, uh, MSIS, I, uh, ISAC, uh, they are all warning uh, about this new uh, version of log bytes that is out. So, you know, organizations have to pay attention and uh, stay on the right side of security, do everything right in order not to fall victim to uh, this form of attack. Right. So uh, that is the second cyber news that we are putting out there. So uh, you can look more into this uh, if you are interested. But we are going to jump into our topic for tonight, which is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and how it impacts cybersecurity. Right. So, and before we move on, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can please post it in the chat and we will address it as we are moving along. So uh, I know when we looked at chat GPT, we talked about artificial intelligence, what it's about, uh, but we also we are going to go back to it again today and then build from there, uh, also look at machine uh, learning and then the different you know uh, varieties of machine learning uh, to have a better understanding of what we are getting ourselves into when it comes to cybersecurity tools, right? So uh, AI simply stands for artificial intelligence for anybody who is not who have, might have had AI, but you know, not know exactly what it is. So artificial intelligence, what is this all about? Uh, artificial intelligence, we use it on daily basis, right? I can you know, say on authority, everybody on here has had an encounter with artificial intelligence. If you haven't, example of your uh, Siri that you are using, or uh, what is the Amazon one? I don't remember the name of the one Amazon uses. Uh, so I know- Alexa. Apple Alexa, yes, thank you. <laughs> Alexa, Siri, you know, all those are artificial intelligence, right, that we use. And uh, we are going to look into uh, the science behind uh, how they are all able to work uh, and also uh, how it relates to, you know, uh, software that we use in cybersecurity, right? So everybody has an encounter with artificial intelligence already. Uh, your smartwatch, your smartphone. Uh, if you go to a website and you see uh, items that you are looking at, or if you are trying to, you know, buy something from Amazon, and uh, you go there and they have a list of things that you they they think you need, and also you you need it, then you are wondering how are they able to get like the selection so well? Uh, that bet suits exactly what you are looking for. Uh, all that is partly from artificial intelligence, right? So artificial intelligence simply is uh, a computer system or a system performing a task that a human being is supposed to perform. So a system that has been trained to kind of mimic the intelligence of a human being, right? So an example of some of the things artificial intelligence can do is uh, voice recognition or uh, recognizing speech. That is why Alexa, when you say, Alexa, what time is it? Alexa will be able to tell you exactly what time is it. Uh, how are you doing today, Alexa? It will give you some really funny, uh, I'm doing awesome and say some really smart stuff. 
right? Uh, all that is part of artificial intelligence. It's been trained to do that, right? It's just doing all that from a set of database that has been uh, uh, set up, right, into the system for it to be able to do that. So making decisions, artificial intelligence can also make decisions. Understanding language, example of what I gave, right? Uh, so uh, there are a lot of uh, technologies that goes into making AI what it is, right? So uh, AI includes a lot of technologies, uh, including machine learning. So machine learning is part of AI, right? Machine learning, we have also deep learning. We have natural uh, language processing. Uh, we have computer vision and robotics, right? So, uh, but our focus for tonight is going to be predominantly on machine learning. And within machine learning, there are different uh, varieties of machine learning also as well. Uh, so, but this is a very interesting topic. Uh, you can dig more into it uh, once we are done today, right? Uh, although, you know, uh, now it plays a very vital role in security and also in the making of machine uh, or artificial intelligence products, security is also needed, right? So they all, you know, depend on each other. Okay? So now let's look into machine learning. Uh, what is machine learning all about? Uh, so machine learning is a subset of AI, like I said earlier. Uh, it involves computer systems uh, learning from data, right, without being explicitly programmed to do so. So uh, an example, your uh, systems that are trained to detect uh, uh, anomalies within traffic on uh, a company's network, so we cannot program uh, this, maybe your firewall, we cannot, like your stateful firewall, we cannot program it to uh, know all the different behaviors, right? Or, or all the different tre trends that might be happening, but we can train it to detect and decide for itself, you know, what is good and what is bad, right? So uh, we don't necessarily have to program or we cannot really make up uh, or we, we cannot really uh, anticipate all the different things that might happen, but if we train it to be able to make decisions uh, based on the data it is collecting at that point in time, uh, that is doing that, we are using machine learning, right? So machine learning literally is your machine or like whatever system that we are setting up, uh, we are teaching it to learn, like a human being will learn. So like how you learn how to speak, uh, any language is the same way we are programming or like we are setting up uh, whatever program that we've made to learn uh, things as they happen and to make decisions based on that. So that is what all that is all that machine learning is about. Right. So it can make decisions and uh, not because we fed it with data to be able to spit out those decisions, but it will make decisions from inferring from, you know, what is uh, in the environment. And so with machine learning, uh, we have different varieties of it as well. So we have su uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning, right? So this is not by any means an AI class. So we're not going to get uh, too deep into the areas, but at least uh, on the surface, uh, an introduction into what they are and all that. So we are going to get into what supervised learning, unsupervised learning, uh, and reinforcement learning are, right? So with uh, supervised learning, uh, what we are doing in machine learning or this type of machine learning model, uh, what it does is we are using labeled data, right? So uh, the, like, the system is being trained to give a specific output based on the data that it is going to come in contact with, right? So uh, it can give the correct output, uh, like the correct output is known, right, for each input that we give it. Right, so uh, supervised one, we are kind of uh, training it with known data, and then it's going to so input data, and it's going to give us like a known answer. With unsupervised is the other way around. Uh, we are using unlabeled data, and here uh, it will make decisions based on patterns that it recognizes, right? Uh, and then reinforcement uh, is also based on uh, how you train your dog, right? So. Uh, when you train your dog, you use reward and punishment, uh, maybe in different scenarios, not, but reward and punishment uh, is what reinforcement uh, learning does. So uh, we kind of train it. If the 
AI is able to get the question or the, the like if it is able to get the question right, uh, we kind of give it a reward, right? If it's not able to get it right, you know, it's kind of some punishment within the uh, the environment that it is. So an example, everybody now chats, uh, GPT, you know, everybody is kind of familiar with it. Now, you know, when, because they are still building it, it's still uh, going through the supervised learning or supervised learning and reinforcement learning, uh, mostly when it gives you feedback, uh, they have some dialogue box on there that is asking you uh, if this is accurate uh, based on what you're looking for. So as you are taking, yes, it is accurate. No, it is not, right? It is all part of the learning process for it, right? So uh, there, there is some reinforcement learning, right? As you are you are getting, as it is getting it right, getting it wrong, uh, it's being rewarded. And then also they are using that to, you know, really adjust uh, how uh, their system is set up. Right. So now what are some of the examples of AI and machine learning that we use on daily basis? So on daily basis, very common one, uh, maps and navigation. So uh, your uh, Google Maps, your Apple uh, Maps that you have or any other software, map software that you have uh, is all using uh, AI and machine learning. <clears throat> so, uh, in the you know back in the days, it was just using uh, GPS. You know, uh, still using GPS, but we have AI also on top of it. That is why it is able to detect and let you know that there is traffic on this route. This is going to be the shortest route. Uh, this is going to be the longest route, but then you're going to save uh, time. This is going to be the the gas efficient route, right? All that is based on machine learning. Uh, AI and, and machine learning, right? So uh, this is something that we use on daily basis. Now, facial recognition and uh, voice recognition or uh, anything biometrics uh, is also using machine learning on AI, right? And everybody has that on their phone now. So you are able to just look uh, into your phone and it's open. You don't have to type in anything or put in a pin, right? Uh, test editors and auto corrections uh, we have that. I think now WhatsApp has it where if you type and it's wrong, it just gives you some auto correction. Now, how is it able to do all that? That is based on AI and machine learning, right? So the system has been trained and fed with a lot of uh, information, and now it's able to pick up on things that you want to type and you know spellings and stuff like that, and also grammarly, grammarly, right? And there are similar ones. You no, know, when I was doing my PhD, I was using that was when grammarly has just come out, and some other ones. I don't know, quite. I don't remember the bad. There were some pretty good ones. I don't think they are now as popular as Grammarly, but uh, all those are uh, some of the uh, use or like some of the uh, benefits that we get from AI and machine learning. Now, search and recommendation algorithms, like I said, uh, if you use Amazon or you use any other uh, service to purchase stuff, they are able to pick up on your behavior uh, online, what things that you are buying and what they uh, uh, anticipate you needing or buying. So uh, um, a typical example for, uh, I think it was Target. Uh, they had one operational manager. I don't remember his name, but uh, I think it was way ahead of the curve when it comes to machine learning and AI. He had them develop a software whereby things that you are buying, they were using that to infer other things that you might need, right? So if they saw that you started buying uh, baby stuff, right? They were able to detect or use that to predict. Uh, no, you were buying pregnancy stuff. They were use that to predict when the baby is possibly due, right? So uh, and they, if you were just buying it as a gift, they were also able to detect and see that okay, you are probably giving it to somebody. So uh, by this time, the person you gave that gift to, their kid will be at this age. So uh, when they are sending brochures out they had uh let's go back they like they would tailor it to you but you may be thinking it is the same that they are sending to everybody but it wasn't right uh, all that is part of that now uh chatbots they are very common now if you go to most websites something will just pop up and then you know an ai will start talking to you uh, if you need assistance and for most organizations they use that as well now uh if you go to their website or if like typically for airlines uh delta they have that 
if you are calling them, they'll ask you to if you want to do test message. And with the test message, you'll be communicating with uh, an AI uh, for them to get a lot of information before they transfer you to an agent, right? And that really helps to save them time and also to cut down on costs in employing a lot of you know call center uh, folks. Now, digital uh, assistants example is what we're talking about Alexa uh, and uh, Siri and you know all those uh, social media. So, how is Facebook when you post something that violates Facebook's uh, community rules and regulations, they will automatically block what you posted. How are they doing that? It's not people who are doing that in real time. It is all AI and machine learning, right? And then also ePay. Uh, now banks are able to detect fraud way ahead of time. Uh, example, if somebody just stole your credit card and they are trying to make purchases, you know, out of the threshold that you normally, you know, use to purchase stuff, uh, the system is going to block it and they will like they will send you an alert for you to know hey this is what is going on right so uh, all those is from uh, ai and machine learning right? so now let's look at uh, ai and machine learning as we will use it in cyber security right so uh, organizations are struggling with uh, protecting their infrastructure Attackers are also smiling because they are also using AI and machine learning to perpetrate the attacks. Now, uh, how will organizations be able to use AI and machine learning to help secure their security posture? Uh, it is what we've been using so far and what has been helping. And we are going to break down uh, all the different areas and the different use cases. So AI and machine learning, uh, they are in a really, uh, I wouldn't say a really good spot, but they came at the right time uh, i'll put it that way uh, because now it is able to help us uh, prevent threats and attacks in real time and we will how uh, that is done is what we just looked at the science behind it is everything that we just talked about now we are going to look at uh, exactly the use or uh, the ways in which uh, ai and machine learning are used in cyber security uh, on the defense side Right. But before then, let's look at some uh, statistics uh, about companies, their perception, their uh, perception about AI and machine learning. So uh, a, a research was done and 61% uh, of organizations uh, admitted that they could have not have identified critical threats uh, if they didn't have any uh, AI uh, integrated systems or AI uh, integrated solutions. Right, 69% uh, of companies also believe that uh, AI uh, is necessary for or uh, will help them in responding to uh, cyber attacks. And then also for the AI uh, industry, uh, it is anticipated that the AI industry is going to grow by $46 billion by uh, 2027. Right, so uh, AI or AI and machine learning, uh, its use uh, and its uh, the benefits that we are getting out of it uh, on the cybersecurity defense side, uh, you know, it's only going to go up, right? Uh, so AI is also uh, combining AI and security is something that you can also look into, you know, as you are building your career as a security professional. You know, you can't do that without actually paying attention to AI as well. So uh, the three main ways that AI and machine learning can help in cyber defense uh, are what we are going to look at, right? So first, determining uh, or detecting uh, anomalies within uh, our setup, right? So uh, if you are familiar with maybe lo going through logs and trying to determine and trying to identify patterns, or if there is an incident and you have to go through maybe five months of logs or like, let's say even a week worth of logs and you are going through line by line, uh, IP address, incoming, outgoing uh, ports, and you know uh, trying to identify what went on. Uh, if you've done that before, you really appreciate uh, the use of AI uh, solutions uh, in doing that, right? So now uh, anomalies can be detected within record time Right. If it's going to take uh, the human eye to pick up on, you know, some uh, anomalies within our setup, 
or on our network, if it's going to take a human being five days, uh, it's probably going to take AI less than maybe uh, less than maybe uh, a minute or five minutes to detect it, right? So it's going to save us a lot of time, and we don't have to, you know, waste time if there is an attack or uh, a potential attack that might be going on that or that somebody might be trying to uh, execute on our network, right? So detecting uh, anomalies. Uh, is one of the uses. So there are different, you know, varieties of that, you know, that we can have in a software, right? A cybersecurity software. But uh, in general, this is one big uh, umbrella under which, you know, uh, other softwares can come out of still using AI. Now predicting future uh, data breaches. So AI can help us to predict future, future data breaches. So AI and machine learning, uh, because they are able to process large amount of data right uh within a very short time and they are able to forecast or make forecast uh, as to the type of threats that might you know take advantage of what type of vulnerability and you know what is potentially going to happen because they are not just going to decide this in a vacuum but based on data that we've given it right and then also based on the training the machine learning part of it whereby it is able to you know uh think and make decisions right, based on how we've trained it to uh, do, right. And the last one is uh, responding to data breaches in real time. So uh, I think both detect detecting uh, anomalies and predicting future uh, breach, uh, future data breaches uh, kind of all tie in into responding to a data breach, right. So if we are able to spot uh, anomalies in time, uh, that will help prevent breaches from occurring. But then let's say the bridge does okay, right? Uh, how are we able to respond to it? So uh, an example, if you have intrusion detection uh, and intrusion prevention systems, so with the intrusion prevention, we know it's gonna detect the intrusion and then also prevent it, right? Uh, without human input, right? So that is an example. There are other uh, solutions out there that will do the same. And there are some that will even create a patch for whatever, uh, uh, software, uh, like whatever uh, vulnerability that is being taken advantage of, right, without any human input. But although alerts will be sent to uh, the human part of the equation, but then by the time you get it and respond, uh, maybe the AI would have taken care of it already or have tried to uh, take care of it. So those are the three main, uh, we will say maybe the three main or the three broader uh umbrellas under which we use ai and machine learning right now let's look at some use cases uh of using ai and machine learning in cyber defense now when we talk about use case in cyber security we are talking about situations right or scenarios under which we will use ai uh, or how we are able to use ai so uh, everything that we are going to look at here can all be categorized and you know uh, bundled under the three main uh, broad umbrellas that we looked at. Right? So the first thing that we will look at is scoring network risks. So AI helps us to score or rank risks within our systems or within our infrastructure, right? So that is one thing that AI can help us to do. Uh, and then also detection of intrusion. So like the example that I gave uh, with intrusion detection systems and prevention systems and other uh, so tools, you know, and other tools that are out there, we are able to detect intrusion uh, way earlier than uh, we will normally have if it was people monitoring it, right? So now uh, AI is not necessarily going to, you know, uh, do away with the job of a uh, stock analyst, but, you know, AI tools, uh, so if you're a stock analyst, you have to really look into mastering and specializing and keeping up to date with AI uh, cybersecurity tools. Uh, because that is going to really help you on your job and you know if you know how to use it well then you are not dispensable right so uh and that is speaking directly to intrusion detection right and intrusion uh, intrusion prevention and all that right and the next one that we look at is identifying suspicious behaviors so suspicious behaviors uh can easily be detected by ai and machine learning uh if we have, you know, uh, set it up right. All uh, these systems have been trained right to detect uh, such behavior. And this 
uh, is will be classified under the bigger umbrella of detecting uh, anomalies on our uh, network, right? So an example, if the traffic flow within your organization, mostly at uh, 12 noon, you know, is maybe, let, if you are just looking at it in percentages, it's around like 30%, right? So that is average, so 30 to maybe 40%. Now, uh, on like today at 12 noon, the system detects or your firewall detects uh, traffic coming in and is over like 120%. You know the volume that it normally receives. The like the system is going to really uh, suspect this kind of behavior and flag maybe most of the traffic or you know raise an alarm, right? So uh, this is some of the use of uh, AI and machine learning, some of the use cases, and then also detecting fraud, right? Uh, it can easily detect fraud based on how we have set it up because uh, it picks up on human behavior. And it picks up on you know what will be considered as a usual as a usual activity or a normal activity you know and what it will also be considered so anything that is outside the norm uh, will raise suspicion and in so doing we'll be able to prevent uh, fraud. Okay. Now uh, the last one that we will look at is discovering malware, which is really a pain in the behind for most organizations today, especially uh, ransomware. Right, and we just look at the new, like we saw in the news, uh, there is a new version of uh, uh, Logbytes, right? And Logbytes, now the company that does it, they are selling it or licensing it to people as if it was like Windows uh, Office uh, or like something on those lines or like Zoom, right? And people are using that to perpetrate attacks, right? So if we have AI and machine learning, uh, but based software that we are using in cybersecurity that is able to help detect uh, or discover malware uh, before it infects our system, or even if our system has been infected, uh, it will be a step in the right direction. And we have these tools there now, right? Uh, so uh, sometimes some of these malware will really, you know, uh, sit and make themselves comfortable on your network hide in there uh, before you'll be able to detect it. But if you have a really good AI and machine learning based cybersecurity tool, uh, you'll be able to detect this and really you know, kick it out of your network or your infrastructure as soon as possible. So with that, we are going to look at some of the benefits uh, of using AI or machine learning based tools in cybersecurity, right? So uh, first, we are going to look at uh, cost. So obviously it is going to lower cost. And we'll look at some data or a, a report by IBM, uh, whereby uh, companies that are using AI uh, and machine learning uh, cybersecurity tools, uh, when they experience a data breach, it costs them $3 million less than organizations that are not using AI or machine learning systems. Right, so uh, we will look at that statistics here shortly, but uh, AI increases the speed of detection and responding to uh, attacks. It lowers the cost, uh, IT cost overall, because uh, AI will be uh, doing uh, some of the manual labor, you know, in an automated fashion. So we don't need as many people uh, to be doing some of those manual stuff. Uh, so in total, it will be re reducing cost. Uh, also, it increases the effectiveness of people working within the cyberspace. So for security analysts and everybody working uh, in security, you become more effective if you have a tool uh, such that is backed by AI and machine learning. Uh, and then also not, so the effectiveness is also going to depend on, you know, who is using it, but uh, this is like the tool itself uh, will be good. So whoever is using it, if well trained, uh, will be able to, will become very effective, right? and also improving the overall security posture of the organization. AI will help improve the security posture, overall security posture of the organization uh, because of everything that we've talked about and we've, we've looked at, right? So this is the report that I was talking about, this IBM Data Breach Report. Everybody can take a look at it. You can Google it, IBM Data Breach Report. It gives you a very uh, great insight into data breaches uh, for 2022. Right, so uh, these are some of the highlights of it uh, as it pertains to AI and automation tools and machine learning. So 
like what I just talked about, for organizations that are using AI and machine learning tools, when they experience a breach, it costs them $3 million less than organizations who are not using AI or machine learning tools, right? And then uh, something else that is outside, yes, using AI or machine learning tools, for organizations that are taking incident response seriously, organizations that have, like an organization that has an incident response team, and not just the team, but the team also practice, or they do to tabletop exercises on a regular basis, uh, when they experience a data breach, it costs them uh, $2.6 million you know, less, or they save uh, $2.6 million on average than organizations who are not taking incident response seriously. So for uh, everybody on, or uh, for the folks who are our interns, uh, who just, you know, went through the uh, incident response project that we did, uh, this is something for you to also, you know, keep in mind, right? So I kept stressing on uh, organizations who, uh, you know, pay special attention to incident response and take it seriously, uh, even when there is a breach, uh, it's not going to be as grave, the impact is not going to be as grave as opposed to organizations who are not taking incident response seriously, right? And this, you know, is not, this report wasn't made by Dr. Uh, so this report found that organizations who are taking this seriously in terms of incident response, uh, it costs them 2.6 million less than those who are not, right? And if it was my organization, I would love to save the 2.6 uh, million, right? So, I'm going to take because it's not going to cost you 2.6 million to take incident response seriously or to have tabletop exercises to have an incident response plan have a whole program set up uh, that is a very oil uh, engine that can be spun up at any time right so and then also for organizations that are implementing zero trust architecture uh, they save on average a million dollars uh, than those who do not uh, practice that right and coming back to ai for organizations that are using net detection and response technologies, which falls under AI and machine learning tools, it saves them uh, on average 29 days if there is a breach. So if it's going to take an organization without such a tool, uh, maybe uh, uh, 50 days to really overcome the breach, uh, for organizations that are using AI and machine learning uh, tools such as uh, XDR tools uh, or SDR technology is going to take them 29 days less to really recover, right? And if there is a bridge, the longer it takes you to recover, uh, the more that you're going to lose in terms of money, in terms of goodwill, in terms of everything. So uh, you want to bounce back as quick as possible. So AI will help the organization to do that as well. Right? So now we are going to look at some of the most useful or most powerful AI tools that we have out there and then once we're done uh we'll you know bring in our panel and they can also speak to what they are the tools first they are going to go through the tools they are using on the job and then you know we will discuss the ai aspect of it and how it is able to help them uh, do some of the things that if they were supposed to do manually you know will take them time and a lot of uh, pain right so uh, there are a lot of ai tools on the market now uh some you know every day there are new tools coming up uh, but uh, the principle behind how these tools work uh, is AI and machine learning. So if you have a better understanding of AI and machine learning, uh, most of these tools are, are going to uh, not really wow you, but uh, you at least you know what it is about and how effective uh, you'll be able to use it to secure your infrastructure. So the list uh, that we are going to look at, we are no, but we are not by any means associated with any of these companies or promoting them in any means this is only for educational purposes right so uh not to you know uh, say somebody is better than the other but uh, for the ai some of the powerful ai tools that are out there in cyber security now uh, sophos uh, inter uh, intercept x and then we have uh, uh, Sematech endpoint security splunk user behavior analytics and uh, vector tricks detection and response, and IBM SKU radar uh, advisor with uh, Watson, right? So we will look at them individually and kind of have an understanding of what they are used for, right? And then uh, we'll bring in our panel. So for Sophos, uh, Sophos is one of the players in the industry. Uh, they are Intercept X, 
uh, is one of the AI machine learning tools and it is an endpoint uh, protection solution. So what do we mean by this? Uh, it is used to protect your laptop, your desktop uh, or your service, right? So uh, for endpoint uh, protection solution, it kind of works uh, similar to uh, not really an uh, antivirus because then now you will be limiting uh, its effect. It does way more than that, right? And it is able to respond to threats. Uh, it uses deep learning, another variety of, or another version of uh, machine learning. Uh, or, no, it, it uses deep learning, uh, which is on the same umbrella with machine learning uh, to respond to threats. And uh, so you can dig more into it and learn more about that. Uh, if your company is you looking for tools, uh, endpoint protection solutions, you know, this is uh, a place to look. Uh, Sematec endpoint security, uh, this is also uh, one of the machine learning uh, tools. And everybody knows, or if you are not familiar, uh, Sematec, uh, they are really, uh, their strong hold is on the antivirus and anti malware side of the house, right? That is their specialty. And uh, there are two, this two, the endpoint uh, security obviously is also used for malware prevention. And it uses AI and machine learning to help fix any vulnerabilities uh, that it might find and also give you alert if, you know, uh, such, uh, you know, anything malware uh, is detected. Right? Now Splunk uh, is also known for uh, being one of the uh, one of the key players within the security industry. And they are, you know, like one of their biggest tools is the Splunk SIM tool, right? They have different varieties of uh, Splunk tools, but the SIM tool is the biggest. So when we say Splunk, everybody's mind just goes straight to their SIM tool. Now they have a user behavior analytics tool, which also falls under AI and uh, machine learning. So this uses unsupervised uh, machine learning to model uh, how different users uh, act. So it's kind of, as the name suggests, uh, user behavior analytics. It picks up on your behavior on, you know, uh, on the network, and it uses that as a baseline. So anything that you know goes uh, above the baseline is uh, deemed uh, an anomaly. So uh, the system will react uh, accordingly, and uh, it will prevent such uh, anything uh, that might you know, try to take advantage uh, of your uh, network. It will try to prevent that, right? So uh, that is number three on the list. Now let's look at the last two. So the last two, the Vectra uh, Threat Detection and Response. Uh, this platform also uses AI and machine learning uh, to detect attackers across different environments. And then uh, no matter the size or uh, no matter how uh, quiet the attacker might try to be on your network, it is able to fish it out. And based on a lot of data, you know, that it is using to do this detection, threat detection and response, right? Now, the last one that we will look at is also, is a QRadar. So QRadar, uh, IBM's QRadar, right? QRadar is also, uh, QRadar itself, uh, IBM QRadar is a, is a SIM tool. Uh, and IBM, everybody knows IBM, right? They are one of the biggest, players in the IT space. And they are uh, they are also very uh, a big player when it comes to the cyber security space or information security space. They are QRadar uh, is one of the big SIM tools that kind of go head in head with Splunk and Archer and the rest. But they have the QRadar advisor uh, with Watson. So Watson for, Q, for uh, IBM, Watson is kind of their, uh, their Siri or their uh, the other one from uh, Alexa is kind of the Siri or the Alexa, right? Uh, and that's in combination with the curator advisor. Uh, they use that uh, with the backing of AI and machine learning uh, to help also maintain uh, a secure network, right? And they kind of uh, do more on the side of the soft uh, side of the house. Right, so for security uh, operations, center operations, uh, they are able to automate most of the things uh, that are done on that side, right? So that is like I kept saying, if you want to really excel on the SOC, 
uh, aspect of the house. You, know, you have to really dive deep into some of these tools, right? Even the ones you are not used to. Mostly when you go to the websites for these companies, uh, they will kind of walk you through how to use it. And also there will be free versions that you can download and use and practice. Right? So uh, for anybody who is interested in becoming a SOC analyst, uh, look into uh, you know these tools as well. And just not just these five that we listed, there are a whole list of it uh, in the 50s and 100s, probably if I'm not mistaken, but there is a whole list of it, right? So not what we just listed is uh, our top five, right? Most powerful uh, AI and uh, machine learning tools that are out there on the market today, but there is a whole list of it uh, out there. Okay. So now uh, we are going to uh, leave, like bring in our panelists and they are going to speak to what they are doing on the job. So first uh, we will just pick everybody's brain on the tools that they are using. And then we will uh, also, you know, uh, leave the floor for them to talk about uh, how they think AI and machine learning plays a role in the tools that they are using. So uh, our panelists, if you are here, uh, let me unshare my screen. Uh, please go ahead and you can raise your virtual hand and then we'll call you one after the other. Uh, and everybody who is going to speak, they are all uh, members of the Arrhythmus uh, family. Uh, they all came from uh, other uh, industries, right? Switch into cybersecurity. Some be working for two years plus uh, a year and change, right? So we have our own in-house resources that we are going to use. So uh, I'll let Benis go first. Uh, she's the one who raised her hand first and then uh, Raul will go and everybody else uh, who was, uh, who is part of the panel can also raise their virtual hand. And then once we're done, we'll look at the questions in the chat. Right. So go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for this opportunity and good evening to everyone. So my name is Bernice, as Dr. Lee has said. Uh, so I mean, I am information assurance analyst for one of the federal agencies. So currently the tool that we use uh, is, a G is Archer, which is a GRC tool. We also have another in-house uh, tool that uh, we're using, but the main tool that is used for our RMS process is the, uh, it's called Archa, which is a GRC tool. So it's used for other things. We have different models. So the Archa can uh, do so many things. It's used for, currently we use it for our ENA and a processes. Um, for, that's the authorization and the assessment process. It's also used for policy management, uh, also for security operation, threat uh, management and continuous monitoring. But, um, I am using or I am familiar with the A and A process. That's what we're using. So we have did all these instances or models that I just talked about. But on my department, as a compliance department, that's the, the C aspect of the GRC, we are uh, responsible or we, we are familiarly or using the, the A and A model that is the assessment and authorization process, uh, implementing the, the sex Arabic process. Uh, to be in this or uh, FISMA compliant. So that's a little bit about the tool that we I'm using on the job. So with all that Dr. Du has said, uh, I believe the AI or the machine learning comes into play in all the aspect of the risk management framework that we, we do using these tools. So like the categorization aspect of, of, of the RMF process, the two help us uh, with the categorization of the of of, uh, of the process. So, like automation and analyzing of uh, large amount of data, and also detection of anomalies. So, like when we and normally, let's say, if we take the traditional way, you have to do categorization of the systems. So, you have to de determine uh, the information types of the system of the information the system is going to process and also uh, the system is going, the information the system is going to use and process. But if you're going to go the traditional way, that, that would take you a long time. Imagine the system has, a, the system is going to store or use a lot of information type. But uh, with this tool that we use and with the help of the AI that, that is being built in, this, in the tool, it will help you. You just have to identify the information system 
that the system will be used or the, the system will process and will automatically gives you the categorization type of the system, whether the system is going to, the impact level is going to be high, uh, low or moderate. So that's where uh, the AI comes into play based on what Dr. Edu has uh, taught us tonight. So it's used for the automation of the process and analyzing this large information of data. So with a click of a button, you just, you just have to uh, input your information type then it will, it will generate the impact level or the security categorization of the system. Then when you come to the control selection, which is based off your first process categorization of the system. Uh, uh, so you have to select the controls. So the two will do that for you based on the, the system type, whether it was a high system, low system or moderate system, which you would have done it normally manually and would have taken you time. So this is the benefit of the automation. It saves you time and makes you more effective and efficient. And when it comes to the implementation of the controls, uh, currently for, for that one, you have to do it manually. You have to determine whether the control has been implemented or in place or an other type. So for that, it's done manually. It hasn't been automated yet. But when it comes to the assessment and you have to do the control assessment, so the good thing is that after the control has been assessed, we the automation process and the anomaly, the anomaly detection also come into play, which help us save time. Because after you assess the controls, the controls that were not satisfied, or we call them other than satisfied. That means they didn't, um, they were not either implemented correctly or other issues that were detected by the security control assessor. So automatically, the tool will, will generate a find. If we, the vulnerabilities we call them finding, it will automatically generate a finding for you. That it will tell you it's a vulnerability because it wasn't assessed um, correctly. So because it was detected as a finding, it will generate. You need to. It, it tells you that it's a vulnerability or it's a finding that needs a risk decision. And it, it allows the stakeholders to make that decision whether they, they will remediate it or they will accept the risk. So that's also, it also help us with, so it's kind of, there's a, uh, the, um, the two help us know uh, the anomalies in, uh, in the control assessment based on what the assessors uh, put in the system. So it, it helps in that aspect with the anomaly detection and also when it comes to continuous monitoring also. So uh, even before that, some of our same tools are also integrated with our GRC2, which also generate alerts based off the findings from the assessment and also based off as, uh, findings from um, our security operations. So in that aspect, uh, the AI also comes in, into play with that. So, and also with the continuous monitoring also, we keep monitoring the system even after it has attained its ATO. So when the ATO is coming, uh, the ATO expiration is coming due, since we have this automation in place, it, uh, it alerts you ahead of time that you need to, I think six months, you need to start working on your ATO for the next, um, for the next ATO decision. So it also alerts you six months ahead of time and it guides you through the process. And also, um, I think that's it uh, for now. Dr. Do has it for me. All right, Vanessa, uh, thank you for that input. So I'll let uh, Ernest go next because he also kind of works in the similar space. So Ernest, uh, you can introduce yourself. Uh, my name is... Uh... People call me Katanomin, uh, others know me as Ernest. Uh, so I've been a member of this group since the latter part of 2019. And then uh, I've benefited a lot. Uh, I work in the same industry with uh, Benis. I work in one of the uh, most powerful federal agencies in the US uh, where we deal with critical and then sensitive uh, information or data. So whatever Benis has taken us through, I know some of you uh, would get confused about what, what she's talking about. Basically, uh, most of the federal agencies or the organizations, what they do is that 
they have a lot of systems. Right? Let me give you one example. Let's say Boeing or Lockheed Martins. Lockheed Martins is a federal contractor uh, who builds uh, the fighter jets for, for, for DOD and the rest. So whatever they are developing for the DOD, before DOD will put that system into operation, that system will have to go into what we call ANA process or assessment. Because it's like, hey, you are going to write an, an exam. After the exam, somebody will have to uh, examine you, mark you, and then give you a cert certificate. So in the olden days, we used to call it uh, authorization and certification, but now we call it as uh, assessment and then uh, uh, authorization, where you can receive an ATO at the end of the day. So every system uh, will have to go through this process. And looking at how big these industries are, for example, in my organization, we have a lot of systems like city systems that people will have to manage. My, my role in my organization is an ISSO, which is a information system security officer. So I, I, I am in charge or I have to make sure that uh, we have a good security posture for the organization. So anything that uh, boils down, anything that relates to security, whether technical or non-technical, I have to make sure that everything goes on well because they, they will tell you that the system belongs to you. So you work with what we call stakeholders. So a stakeholder could be uh, an authorization official, an ISO, who, who we normally call information system owner. So the system that you are working on, it has an owner. So you are the representative of the owner in your organization. And then making sure that the system goes through successful uh, assessment and then implementation. So we, we rely on the RMF process, which is seven currently. So Ben is left one, the, the, new, the new process, we call the preparation, which has been added to make it seven. So you go through all this process, categorization, selection of security control, implementation, assessment, uh, 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 continuous monitoring and all that. But uh, the tool that Venice is using, I'm also using the same tool, but mine we have, we have, we have, we have as a company, uh, that is an, the RSA Archer company to build a specialized one for us due to the kind of uh, data or information that we are using. Uh, we are dealing with space information. We go into space and then we, 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 we route information from the space to the ground. So anything that goes wrong will, will, will become a national security issue. So we have to make sure that everything security, everything about risk is dealt with very, very comprehensively. So uh, I'm, I'm bringing my point to the last process, which is a continuous monitoring, because once we are doing a continuous monitoring, that means the work or the job does not end. After you have received a certification or an ATO, it doesn't end there. You have to still roll over, start all over again, assessing your system. But when it comes to the continuous monitoring, one thing we do there is that we use a lot of tools, a lot of tools. So in my organization, we have like 13 tools that we are using, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through all the 13 tools. I'm going to take about three or four that we, 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 we use for our work that helps us in terms of the AI and, and all that. One of the uh, uh, intrusion detection systems tools that we use, we call it uh, McAfee or Red Seal. This is a very powerful tool that, that looks on your network, make sure that there is no anomaly on the network because it has been configured such a way that anything that, anything that becomes an alien, the system will automatically detect it and then deal with every anomaly on the system. Another one tool we, we use is called Four Scout tool. It is also used as a user and, and, and entity behavior. So anything that's good, so with this Four Scout, it helps to dis, uh, detect insider threats. So anything that that's the system sees as an insider threat, it will automatically bring it out. So there is a capability or an inbuilt AI within all the tools that we are using. Because as, as if you look at doctor's last slide, look at the money people are spending in case there is a data breach. I'm telling you in my organization, when there is a slightest breach of data, we, we call it billions because it's, it's even, I mean, it's a national security issue. So it's very, very expensive. So they don't, they don't play with these tools. It doesn't matter how much it costs, they have to go and buy it and make sure that the work is done and done successfully. Another tool that we use uh, again is, uh, what we called the, I've mentioned the ratio. We use Palo Alto. We use a uh, 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 scene tool like Splunk itself. 
So there are a whole lot of tools. So all these tools that I have mentioned, they have inbuilt capabilities and then uh, intelligence to do all this work. Because some of the things that we used to do manually, now it has been taken off because those times people will have to go inside the, 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 the sock room, go and log in, go and configure, do this and do that. But now you don't need people physically to be there and then the system automatically will check all the networks, will check both the traffic coming in and going out and then make sure that whatever needs to be done is done perfectly well. So this is a little I can tell you about what we do and the systems that we manage. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ernest. Uh, we appreciate we appreciate your input. Uh, I'm going to let Raul also go. I think Raul also work in the government space. So uh, Raul, you can take it from there. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, hello, Doctor Adu. Um, you know, thank you for the for this opportunity. Thank you to Bernice and Ernest for the great uh, insight. So. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Raul Kaze, so I'm a senior lead, uh, cyber lead for a, um, a company uh, we support, a government agency. So um, in my in my environment, we we monitor about you know thirty thousand uh, endpoint endpoint devices. So um, those devices generate you know, like a massive amount of data and uh, and logs. So we, we we are facing a lot of challenge right now. So and uh, some of those challenge are you know like I said those massive amount uh, volume of data, and uh, we we have discovered some new sophisticated technique used by attackers. Uh, we really need to reduce uh, our response time. And we need to develop, you know, a more preventive approach than the defensive approach that we're having right now. So that's where, you know, the intelligence comes into play. So, and also we, one of the challenge we're facing now is to reduce the alert fatigue. So, uh, you know, we need tools with a signature with more uh, accuracy. And uh, we are facing a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, cyber attacks and, uh, like other government agency, and uh, and we have the the way the conventional way of detecting malware and threat are almost failing. Like we always say, you know, uh, prevention always fail. So and uh, also, you know, we have those cyber criminal that are frequently entering into the digital system with smarters and new method to bypass uh, access firewall and control and you know and compromise uh, the high secure network so to help us to uh, meet those challenges we are we are using a tool that is called um, elastic uh, elastic uh, machine learning so uh, elastic uh, machine learning is uh, is natively built into elastic platform you know this shows the how important is the topic that we are talking about tonight? So the, the elastic machine learning that we are using uh, is a engine is a data analytics. So that gives us uh, a flexibility to use both, uh, you know, unsupervised and supervised uh, machine learning models. And also it help us detect anomalies and uh, outliers from, you know, our different group and uh, inside the thread. And uh, also, uh, you know, is it help us also in terms of savability and you know, and domain-centric machine learning model. So, um, machine that uh, elastic machine learning, you know, really give us a lot of uh, it accelerates. I would say like that observability, security, and improvement in our system and the detection system by you know, collecting all those logs. Uh, remember that we we are we operate as a platform, as a service, right? So we were a cloud, a huge cloud platform. And uh, those platform and just our, our cloud platform monitor all the data from different government agency. So, and uh, the, the elastic ML uh, machine learning tools help us in, in, you know, in terms of collection of those logs and then uh, by by using what is called the bit so and they also have aggregating all those log with what is called the lock the lock stash and uh, 
in terms of storage, it also helps us by indexing those logs properly and by using what is called elastic search. And also it facilitates the search of those logs, you know, through what is called Kibana. So, and most important is, is alert us when it detects an anormality within the system or so we can take, uh, you know, action if not automatically done. So yeah, so definitely uh, Elastic has been a very great tool with my environment and uh, is, is helping us. We can see a lot of improvement in terms of, you know, the goal that was assigned to us by the government agency and leaders. So uh, definitely it was not possible, right, for a human being to analyze all those data. We're talking about a lot of terabit of data every day that we're generating almost every second. So is a lot of data. It is no way to analyze and you know to go through all those data using a human intelligence, you know, to detect if everything is right or or detect any anomaly or attacks. So that's what I will say about about the, our environment at this moment. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, bro. Uh, I'll have Michael go next. Uh, so go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Hello. Good good evening, everybody. And uh, I'm Michael. I've been a part of the Arrhythmus family and it's been about a year. I currently work for Gentiva Health Services, which is a health, healthcare facility here in the state. And I've been with Gentiva for about, uh, about six months. So thanks, you know, thanks to the, our previous panelists and uh, more or less the tools basically, you know, do almost the same thing. So they've already gone over everything I would say. And I actually like to focus on what I think the tool, you know, can help uh, you guys and whoever is actually currently taking any courses in cybersecurity, either with arithmetic or, you know, wherever you are. So the three tools, the three main tools I use for my daily job. Uh, so the first one is uh, Zen GRC. So I'm actually a GRC specialist. So Zen GRC, and then we have Qualys and uh, Proofpoint. So Zen, Zen GRC basically manages our compliance. So with Zen, Zen GRC, I am able to design IT controls. So basically with the IT controls, that's when the compliance comes into play. So compliance for frameworks such as SOX uh, compliance, that's the SOX, and then the HIPAA compliance since it's a hospital facility. So basically the Zen GRC helps with that. It also helps with risk register. So I actually you know, want to focus on what the tools can help you guys do so that way when whenever you're in the classes and you are taking the courses okay so you know you can refresh and you know get back to uh, whatever i'm saying and be like okay i know michael said this you know can help this tool can help me do this or achieve this goal so these tools so the zen GRC can help with compliance risk register policy review vulnerability exception vendor risk management and uh, okay i already said policy review so basically with that uh, let me give a let me give a brief example, right? So with risk register, basically in uh, Zen GRC in the tool, we create a control, and then that control we can attach all the risk in the organization to that control. So whenever there is a change, you can always go into everything is automated. But then uh, even though it's automated, you always need a human, you know, factor. So the human factor, being the GRC specialist, have to go in whenever there is a change in our security environment. We have to go in and uh, input that change so it reflects on uh, whatever you know the dashboard on the Zen GRC is uh, is providing us. So as I said, you can also use it for risk register, that's third party risk uh, risk management as well. Policy review. So with policy reviews, so yearly we go through a policy review where we have to resubmit all our policies and make sure the policies have been approved by the management and uh, the executive. So we do that through the Zen GRC tool, which is uh, which is Zen GRC. So the other uh, tool uh, I mentioned was Qualys. So we use we use that for vulnerability scanning, and I think you know vulnerability scanning more or less those tools do basically the same things. So I'm not going to go over that, but I would like to go over the proof point. So with proof point, basically it manages our PII and PHI data, right? So PII everything every information which is unique to an individual, and we know PHI PHI you know is the is the health data of our patients. So basically we don't want those, you know, those data uh, flying around the net or the networks or flying around unsecured uh, networks. So basically Proofpoint helps that with that. So how does Proofpoint helps with that? So whenever uh, there is like uh, any data, any PII or PHI leaving our systems, 
the proof point tool is going to flag it, right? So once it flag it, it's going to flag it and it's going to send me an alert that, hey, like Michael, like there is uh, like this user or this nurse or this doctor is sending out PHI or PII for some reason. So then it's my role to go into the alert and uh, reach out to whoever the user is and uh, be like, hey, why is this, you know, data leaving our system? So then they have to give me a business justification for that. And what, what could be the business justification? It could be, okay, we are sending this uh, data out for, you know, referrals for medication or something. So basically they have to explain to me why this data is leaving our systems. And if the, if the justification is sound, then okay, I can accept it and, uh, you know, make a record of it in the, in the Gen GRC tool, which is the, so basically these three tools work in conjunction with, uh, with each other. So Proofpoint uh, manages our data leaving our systems, Qualys does the scans, and Zen GRC manages our GRC, our, our GRC program. So basically, yeah. So that's, I would say that's what all I'll have for now. And if anybody have any questions later, then you can always, you know, reach out. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Michael. So uh, George put his contacts in the chat. He wants to get with you. Uh, I think George is also, uh, he just started working as a GRC analyst. So okay. maybe probably you guys can uh okay. share some ideas and give him some pointers all right uh so i'll let isaac uh go and then kenny will go go ahead isaac good evening everyone um my name is isaac i um i have been with the uh, arrhythmias since about 20 2020 2019 2020 and um uh, i definitely have all the praise that I can say for a witness, and Dr. Adu. I am an infrastructure and security analyst for a, a biopharma company with a global footprint. So you can imagine the attacks that we have. The, our attack surface is quite, is quite big, it's quite broad. And uh, I, was, I was very uh, impressed with, the, uh, with this topic that Dr. Adu presented today. Um, incidentally, the uh, this tool, one of the main tools that we use is what you mentioned, Sophos. So we use Sophos. Um, it's a whole suit. It's a whole suit of tools. Uh, they call it Sophos Central, and uh, Sophos Intercept X is just one of them. Um, so their tools cover both uh, all endpoint networking, uh, email, cloud, but Intercept X. The Intercept X tool uh, specifically is the one that uh, is AI and machine learning powered. So how we use our Sophos, how we use Sophos Intercept, uh, the Intercept X tool. Um, first of all, as Dr. Adu has mentioned, this tool utilizes a deep learning um, a neural network to conduct deep analysis and to determine um, if a file is safe or malicious in 20 milliseconds. I, I, re I realize you mentioned about the the absolute insane amount of time that AI actually brings into the field in under 20 milliseconds before it actually executes that particular file. So this definitely helps, helps me um, and the other analysts on my team in executing our duties um, in a way that SOPOS also helps us automate many tasks uh, that we can't often handle manually. As I mentioned, we have a global footprint. There is a lot, a lot of attacks that come uh, through to the system, but SOPOS helps us to automatically detect um, even unknown workstations and servers and any other hardware on the network. Um, in this, I mean, you can, you can easily spin up you can easily spin up a virtual machine if you want to maybe a test environment to test out something before you actually release it into production and you can forget about it. And another person, another team can do that and forget about it. And before you know it, you have what we call a virtual sprawl. You have so many uh, workstations in the virtual cloud that you actually don't use. Those are all potentials for, for an attack. So Sophos definitely help, has helped us um, of uh, detect any unknown workstations and you know virtual machines. Um, the best thing I think of realize with Sophos 
that it can help us. It has really helped us to detect patterns within large quantities of data. As the previous uh, uh, contributors have mentioned, when you find yourself dealing with an enormous amount of data that we as humans, we cannot analyze, we cannot see in real time. Uh, for example, um, detecting key patterns of hackers, uh, posting emerging threats you know, on the dark web, um, the machine learning aspect of AI is able to dig deeper into the into the dark web and find um, if an attack being hatched and take care of it before it even executes. You know, it's it's just it's just so mind boggling. You know, because um, so AI powered systems like Sophos they can analyze malware based on inherent characteristics rather than you know the old school signatures you know for example um if a piece of software is being designed uh to rapidly encrypt files at once that is like that is suspect that is suspect behavior and if it takes steps to hide from maybe some observation of vulnerability scanners then that's another that's another sign that this software is actually this particular piece of code is not meant for good. So AI will dig deep into that and protect the endpoint before even the malware executes on that. And the beauty about this Intercept X2, it can actually reverse some of the encrypted, or most, they say, most of the encrypted files that can get encrypted by malware, they can get reversed. So. That's another good thing about um, about AI and particularly Sophos. So um, the other one is uh, its entire ransomware capabilities uh, detect and block malware processes uh, used in ransomware attacks. You know, and also this helps us. This has definitely helped us and the entire organization, the enterprise, to reduce the attack surface by controlling which apps and devices that can run in the in the environment by blocking any malicious websites and potentially the dangerous apps on endpoints. Since it's an endpoint kind of like detection and response, it's an XDR tool, as Dr. Adu mentioned. And um, also the other beauty of it, as I mentioned, Sophos is a whole suite of tools. So there is synchronized security. If you sign up, if your license is quite extensive and it covers all these other aspects. So Sophos Intercept X will work in conjunction with their firewall with their firewall tools, and um, and they will automatically isolate compromised devices, you know, while the cleanup is being performed. Now that is that is intelligence, really, on a higher level, and then return the isolated devices uh, back to the back to to the network to be able to access the network once it's been the threat has been neutralized, so, and that is all without the need for for human intervention, you know, for an admin to intervene and uh, and kind of like isolate this particular machine. Yes, you can definitely override and do it manually, but I mean, if this attack happens at 3 a.m., you have no idea, the system will do that, you know? And um, so it, it, it does so many things like integrating with emails, as I've mentioned before, firewalls, servers, and endpoint devices. And also the other thing that I like about it, uh, sniffing out DGS, you know, domain generated algorithms, you know, those fast flux DNS um, servers that attackers definitely love to use. This this is like very quick to be sniffed out by uh, by the AI, because as I mentioned, it uses uh, the deep learning deep learning enriched data to go beyond what the human brain, the human intervention can actually do and ultimately at the end of it all you have kind of like a defense in depth with this powerful powerful tool of ai that you can leverage in your threat hunting and endpoint detection and protection and overall security structure of the organization so the other tool that we have that we use in our enterprise is called active wolf as the previous uh, guests have mentioned, um, they kind of like do almost everything the same, but defense in depth, you can just um, 
kind of like depend on one tool. You're going to try to diversify here and there. You know, one tool does something else that the other one do doesn't do. But overall, the umbrella is, is the same. So Arctic Wolf and Sophos are the ones that we use. Yep. That's my um, that's my uh, submission. In case anyone right. has any questions, I can elaborate further. All right, Isaac. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will go to Kenny, and then Kwame, and then Sheila. Then we will open it to the floor and uh, to the whole group, and we will take uh, comments and questions. Go ahead, Kenny. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Kenny Noisette, and I've been with the Ritmus family since um 2021 um i've taken a few classes with doc, uh, with um dr do in the in the school um and and i i think as isaac was saying it's it's a blessing to have this resource so take advantage of it as much as you can um right now in my current um role i'm, I'm a security analyst um, for one of the federal agencies and um we use a one of the so I'm basically in the, um, my specialization on the security team is continuous monitoring. So I know a few people mentioned like um, GRC, um, like using um, the tools. Um, so their security team, so the security of, of their team is, um, you know, compliant. So me, I'm, I'm more towards, I'd say like the end of the cycle. So after after my boss basically does all the grc stuff i'm the one that has to make like maintain the day-to-day -day, like hands-on tooling stuff so we use a company called um micro focus fortify um web inspect so it basically um secures like the software supply chain and protects the integrity of the code um that the developers on your team are are working on and also to um, basically web inspect is a dynamic application security test testing tool. So basically it's the process of analyzing a web application through the front end to find vulnerabilities. If you don't know what a, a dynamic application um, testing tool is. And I'm just gonna break down um, like three different main differences of application security testing so one of them is static application security testing and that's where the technology that analyzes an application's code to identify security vulnerabilities during the programming development phase of the software development life cycle so that's mostly just the code the raw source code that the developers are are playing around with through the through the cycle and then the dynamic application security testing, which I'm mostly doing on a day-to-day -day basis, is um, using the technology. Um, well, most of the technologies they they're run, they're running the testing or the operation phases of the software development lifecycle. So basically, once I'm doing the testing, the technology simulates an attack against the application and it analyzes the results um, to identify vulnerabilities so basically if you ever go online and you have a chance to you know test out um one of the open um sites about micro focus web inspect you, you'll see how the scanner you're putting um you know the web page that your developers are working on you just you'll put it in there and then you'll see how the the scanner will basically it does like a, it does an analysis of the whole application directory and subdirectories uh, it takes us it takes a short time um within probably a couple minutes and then and it's just automated from the from then on and it's basically going in attack mode um, to find vulnerabilities and then once it's done, it tries to give you um, the best results that it can. And then it'll give you a guide from those results of 
what the developers can change um, at the end of the cycle. And the only the only down part I would say to um, dynamic application security testing is sometimes you'll get some false positives, but that's because it's um, that's the AI where it's it's trying to see um, what what similar applications that that we're using on a day to day basis. Um, it's using its analytics um, to figure out patterns. So sometimes you'll you'll have that false positive, but since we're we're using the tool on a day-to-day -day basis and our DevOps team is also familiar with, you know, you have to know like the OWASP top 10 um, for applications. And once we know those vulnerabilities, they're they're easily um, able to be remediated. And if it's a false positive, we're able to um, you know, to accept that risk and move it on to the chain of command. And then there's a, a third type, um, it's called a runtime application self-protection. So that technology in Web Inspect, it monitors activity at the runtime. And then during the operational phase of the software development lifecycle, it identifies incoming threats and then it enables protection action to be taken. So basically with those three that I mentioned, um, just think of like American football. So you have both teams are on the field and then the, the static application security testing is like offense, the, the team with the ball. And then um, the technology with the team with the ball, the technology is like improving the software by eliminating vulnerabilities. It's like trying to trying to like the team on offense trying to run through the defense. So you're trying to run to get to the other side. So that's basically what the static um, software testing would do. Now, dynamic application testing, it's like the other, the, the team opposite on defense, it's a defensive unit. So web inspect would basically make the, uh, make the technology attack the software at runtime probing for weaknesses so once the offense wants to wants to come towards the defense the defense automatically knows oh this guy's running the ball with the right or left i'm gonna go that way so that's that's basically what the tool is doing um as far as software at runtime and then for for the runtime application self-protection um it's like a special unit so it's not offense or defense it's it's just like a extra protection. Um, it's used less frequently, but the security team can throw it in there when there's critical times that like a like it's more like emergency situations when the hackers are actively trying to penetrate the system in in real time. So a lot of times, most security teams won't use the runtime application self protection with the tool, but it's good to know it just in case if anything were to, you know, be emergent um, or, so, or some type of emergency data call came from the chain of command from an ISSO or something like that. Um, and then lastly, I just want to explain how it really works, like as far as using AI. So, so basically the, the tool basically uses a variety of algorithms um, with like extensive knowledge based on like coding rules that are already in place. And we could also, our, our DevOps team can also manipulate those coding, those coding rules in the tools. Um, so you could scan, you know, the source code for vulnerabilities or scan the application in, in real time when you're going from the start to finish of updating, you know, your applications with code. And, um, there was one last thing I want to say. So yeah, I was going to say that AI could be used um, to automate security testing, um, which involves scanning a system for vulnerabilities and weaknesses. And by using the AI to automate these tests, security teams are like they're 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 able to you know fix the security issues before they could be exploited by hackers. So that's the main main thing you should know about application security testing. 
And that's it. All right, Kenny. Uh, we appreciate your insightful input. Uh, we will give the floor to Kwame. And then after Kwame, uh, Shela will go. Go ahead, Kwame. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kwame. I'm a cyber security lead in my company. And then in my company, we use a lot of tools. We have almost over 30 of them. Some of them, we have like F5, Fastly. We have uh, AWS. We have uh, a lot of them. Cloudflare, but I want to talk about Cloudflare. The whole job, that is an AI machine that uh, in a way sit, uh, like for, for us to understand what Cloudflare does, it's kind of like a, if you want to come into a store to purchase something, but then the Cloudflare is kind of like a front desk that has almost all the list of uh, materials being sold in the store. So whatever you want to buy, they, 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 they wouldn't be able to go to the back of the store or inside the store to purchase what you want, but it will bring it over to you, except one or two situations that you'll be allowed. So in that case, a uh, avoids uh, unauthorized users or hackers being able to penetrate into our environment and then provides everything that you need to uh, whoever wants to get in there that has to be authenticated in the right. So, so is the AI that is monitoring everything that everybody needs and what access you have to have to get into the environment. So if you are logging into an account or you want to access a site that is not approved by our company, admins or the requirements that you have to require to have them, then Cloudflare will not will not give you the permission, but then we will let uh, admins and you have to take an action against whoever is doing that. So the next uh, tool that I want to talk about too is like we use Jira. Jira is one of those things that is kind of like it keeps track of every activity that happens, any event or situations. It keeps track of our ticketing. So before even if you want to like uh, run a server or build a new server, you have to put in a ticket and then your information is there, the ticket, uh, the, the reason why you want to build a server. So for future reports, if there's a situation, if it was build right or not build right, you could fall back at a point in time or if you want to know the procedure you use in building that server, you could keep track of it. And as uh, one of our guys was, was talking about, one of our major AI machine that we use is a proof point. And then we have like an Arctic Wolf, but then we, I think the Arctic Wolf is the main same tool that we kind of like use most, which is also managed by me. That's my responsibility in my company to monitor and then draw attention whenever there's an alert or anything. So the, what it does is like, it has a, a rule on it based on geolocation. And then this access is kind of like, anybody who logs into our company machine, based on where you are, you we have some countries that we have listed that you cannot log in from there. If you do log in from there, you have to have a special reason or you have to have a means to be, Logging from our, our machine from a place like Nigeria, a place like Afghanistan, yeah, China, we we have to find who, why is this guy logging from here? Who is he? I have to reach out to the department manager to find out, like, okay, we have maybe we have maybe Captain AJ or Dr. Du logging in from this. Although it's his machine, why is he logging in from this location? Then you have to give a reason, maybe it's an assignment then you okay you allow that you can go ahead and do it you also that's a generous scan because if we were to sit and then worry about how many people are get logged into a system where they are and what they're doing it will be a tedious job but this uh article does that 
and then even gives you a report on some emails or some uh, domain names that has been involved in the dark web and then draws our attention, gives you, uh, let's say that uh, this computer with the login, computer name, this was involved in this, or email was involved in this uh, dark web scan. So please, when it comes to us that way, we have to reach out to the user, scan their computer to make sure their password is not compromised and there's no uh, negative action coming from their end. It also does give us a report on uh, any activity. This is like a, a zero trust, no matter who logs onto the system, it will give us a list of the admin, what, what time he logged on, the uh, IP address. Even if you go to the point of downloading a lot of materials, it will have to give me an alert that this person logged on this time and downloaded maybe in the Active Directory, downloaded a lot of user information. And I have to reach out to the department to find out, hey, at this time, you are the admin. Did you do this or was somebody who got he got your information and then was acting like you and then so you confirm then you have to close the ticket as we are not but we just find find out what it is so it is it's the form of the whole eye of our company that is what that group does give us all the report the scanning and that is the job uh ai is helping our, uh, most businesses Keep an eye on the network. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kwame. Uh, I think last in the shoot is going to be Sheila. Uh, Sheila, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. I am Sheila. I am a regional analyst uh, at where I work. Um, so in my position, I don't get to use a lot of tools, but I know about tools that we use. Uh, so I do know that we've been using Proofpoint for a while, but recently we did um, make more acquisition. And in um, where I work, the Proofpoint is usually used to monitor or scrutinize um, emails. That is the main reason why um, that was acquired. Um, but one tool that I get to actually uh, get very close to and, and utilize a little bit is one tool we all know before. Um, because my position, I do a lot of education. Um, security awareness training is one major thing that we are very uh, big on. So we do have um, a great amount of users that we have to uh, monitor in terms of security awareness training. Um, it has to be done at least annually. And so when we send it out, um, this tool is helping us to send the, uh, set the awareness training and send it out to the users. When it's sent out to the users, we do have a particular period of time that it needs to be completed. And so as many people that it has been sent to, this tool alert us who completes it. So whenever somebody completes this awareness training, we get to know it. And it also gives us a summary of who has not uh, completed it, especially when people are getting close because um, it is a requirement for them to be able to have access to specific equipment that is given to them. And so when the time is approaching, we need to have a, um, we need to be alerted. That way we remind them of it or we have to sh shut their system down. It's that important. So this tool is very, very critical for my position that um, um, we use that. Um, I don't know if, um, I think a lot of you might probably be aware of what um, phishing simulation is. So we use this tool also to send, send phishing uh, simulation. The simulation is uh, mainly to uh, test. So kind of like a test um, of the user's um, knowledge of what they have learned. So if you send a phishing email, we test it to see, we send this test uh, emails to see who is going to click on it and who is not going to click on it. And of course, whoever click on it is not like a big penalty, but it also gives us an aware, awareness of um, how much 
training they are going to need if they do need extra training and stuff like that. So um, that is mainly what um, I am um, used to in terms of my position. Thank you. All right, Sheila, thank you. I think this, uh, Vincent, your hand was up, but uh, you've lowered it. Uh, if you had a question, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Edu, can you hear me now? <clears throat> Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Hello? Well, we can hear you, Vincent. Right, oh, okay. Um, well, hi, everyone. My name is Vincent from Houston, Texas. Um, I just joined this group about a week ago. I'm in the current... Uh, PCI DSS class at the moment. And um, although I'm not fully into cybersecurity, I only have a, a lab environment at home in which I practice and all that. I can say, even though I'm familiar with some of the tools that have been mentioned, uh, my point is that uh, there's never a time where AI will completely eliminate the human process, meaning, if the AI is so useful, it does all those scans we're talking about. Humans still have to go in there and still verify everything that has been done, you know, and that does not in any way take away the efficacy of the system. The system is very functional. We all know that. But I just like to add that, hey, there's still room for improvement. Um, like I use this new chat GPT a lot. You know, like I'm running some commands on, say, Nexus or even Qualys or something like that. And I just forget how to do something. I go into chat GPT and it just tells you exactly the command line to log. And then you would find what you're looking for. You know, now it tells me that, but I say I have to go impute it or copy and paste it. That's just to tell you that at every point in this technological development, there's still always room for human interactions. Humans still have to be involved in the process. And that's where we'll come, we come in as professionals. So that was just my comment. All right, Vincent, uh, thanks for that comment. So uh, yes, to add to what Vincent just said, uh, this is not to say that AI will by any means take over the whole entirety and uh, now the demand for security professionals is going to reduce. Uh, it's not going to reduce by any means. Uh, AI is going to be a tool that is going to make you more powerful as a security uh, professional. So uh, that is the intent, right? It's just like the self-driving cars that are coming up now, you know, like Tesla is trying to make it. So uh, make it uh, very accessible to uh, everybody. So within, let's say, maybe the next uh, 10 years, right? Uh, self-driving cars are going to be uh, the order of the day, but then uh, still, there still has to be a driver in the seat. Uh, you cannot just be sleeping or, uh, in a self-driving car and, you know, uh, assume the car is going to get you to where you are going. Yes, it has, you know, AI, machine learning and everything in it, but uh, the human aspect of it uh, is always going to be needed, right? So although you probably, so now like with most planes uh, for takeoff and for landing, the plane will literally do it by itself. But you still need, you know, uh, pilots uh, in their home of affairs uh, because you cannot just leave everything to AI or machine learning. And because guess who, guess who made AI and machine learning? Human beings. Right. So the human factor is always going to be needed uh, in this equation. So yes. Uh, so that, now that, 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 I, I do. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to get in. Yeah. And and you, you stole some of my. Glory, um, just like you're, you're, you're saying. Uh, and just, just to expand on, on what uh, my man was just saying earlier, mm -hmm. we have to still have that human element, um, just like with the planes, uh, as a, and, and speaking from experiences, from a truck driver, 26 years as a truck driver, I do agree that there is a place for AI to take away that mundane. Just like you just, just expound on what you were saying. The pilots take off, they land, but the long flight, hey, they sit back, put it on autopilot, AI take control. 
that could be good with auto driving vehicles, auto driving trucks, they could do that. But they still have to have somewhere along the lines that human element. Uh, going back earlier, I think it was, was it Sheila? Was it Ernest? Somebody that said they were working for Boeing. Um, and, and, and correct me if I was wrong. <clears throat> when they get in, when, work for, for Boeing, and you're developing the fighter pilots, the, the fighter planes. AI don't do the dogfight. That's the human element that does the dogfight. Now, that long flight across the Atlantic, Pacific, whatever ocean you choose, off the carriers, whatever, hey, but it has to be the human element in it. And I think where we're going wrong in society is we're trying to replace the human element with AI, but well, let me let me let me reverse that. Let me change that. We're trying to supplement the human element with AI, but what what should be supplemented is AI with the human element. Where AI falls short, that's where the human element picks up at because we got the emotions, we got the all the five senses, you know, we can do that. We can, hey, should I make this kill? Should I not make this kill? Should I do what I need to do? Should I not need to do what I do? And, and, and just to go back, what I was saying about 26 years as a truck driver, that to revamp, get myself together, come back in and relearn cybersecurity. But I, it, it fall right into being with these autonomous vehicles. Fine, drivers get sleep. They get tired. They, that, that mundane thing, that long range road. Yeah, they get sleepy. Fine. Driver's going to sleep. If the all if the AI can pick up on that, pull the vehicle to the side of the road, turn on the flashes, slow it down, stop it. Tell the driver, hey, you better find a place, get off, go to bed, go to sleep. Mm -hmm. AI can't handle everything in traffic. Now, you said Central Texas. Sounded like Fort Hood to me. I was I was down there. I was at, at Fort Hood. I know about Central Texas College. I mm -hmm. live in Dallas, Fort Worth. Familiar with Houston. Heavy mm -hmm. traffic, especially if, you, if you're up in that northeast corner. I don't know about you, but I sure don't want to be behind the wheel of nothing mm -hmm. that's controlling the wheel that I'm not in control of. I mean, you can put it on PTSD. Uh, what you name it, you give it whatever acronym you want to give it. Control issues, I like to be there. Um, but I do, there is a place for AI, but there are some spaces that AI may have to stay out of, at least at this point. Maybe later on down the road when we get better with it. But right now, I think we're going too fast because somewhere along the line, we'll have a regression. Because all it's going to take is one accident, one major incident where there's mass casualties, and then this whole thing will blow up and all of our face trying to push it forward, which works for us who's working in this industry, but it just not might not be there right now because everybody's not working in, the, in this industry. And I mean, all the cars are not autonomous. We still got folks driving cars that still don't operate on computer systems. I mean, you know, we we, we got the, the cars still on the road from the 60s and the 70s. They, it, they don't have nothing to do with computers. So it's mm -hmm. like you still, whatever they do, how is the artificial intelligence going to adjust to that? How is it going to deal with that? But it's going to take that driver, that person behind the wheel to, to deal with that. Sometimes when you're going down the road, you can look at a, at a car but where that person is driving, how they're reacting, and just say, hey, maybe I need to slow down because they're going to do something farther up the road that's going to affect me. And the AI might not pick up. It might just say, hey, all I need to do is stay between the lines, keep it at 55 miles an hour. But sometimes 55 miles an hour with an 80,000-pound payload is still not always in the public's best interest. Great point, Kenny. Uh, great point. 
So uh, if anybody has an input or question, uh, you can bring it up before we wrap it up. So uh, now to the floor, uh, if you have, uh, I know Noah just joined. Uh, like, do you have some inputs, Noah? Uh, I know at your uh, workplace, you're not necessarily using many tools, but uh, if you have some inputs on this one, you can uh, chime in. But uh, any questions for the group before we wrap it up for tonight? Oh, and there were some questions in the chat. I think most of it was addressed. Uh, so Amma was asking if ServiceNow uh, is considered a GRC tool since uh, Achar, okay, let me look at the actual question. Achar is considered uh, AI. Will ServiceNow also be considered one since it's, okay, so yes, uh, what ServiceNow is doing, it has some AI to it and machine learning to it as well, right? So. Uh, Yes, when it comes to the AI portion, yes, we can see that, right? Uh, I think either than that, that should be everything on here. So, uh, uh, okay. Now for uh, our workshop that is coming up, uh, we are starting off on the 25th uh, and the special promotion that we were talking about ends tomorrow night. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, working on real cyber security projects uh, and uh, really polishing up on your cyber security skills uh, please do well and enroll in it uh, for all entry-level students uh, this is an added on to the course so if you are done with the course you can uh, jump into it also and for our next pci live session we are starting our next pci live session in april uh, i think is probably going to be around the the uh, april 18th uh, i stand to be corrected let me check that here real quick Yes, it's going to be on uh, April 18th for our next PCI uh, class. That is a live session. Now you can join it for the PCI class anytime. Uh, you can join anytime and go through the online version whilst you wait for the live session to uh, start. Right. So I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we will meet again next week, uh, same time for Cyber Chat. For interns, we are meeting tomorrow. For the current interns, we are meeting tomorrow, uh, same time. And uh, this recording will be posted on YouTube. The live session uh, is on there already because we are streaming on, on YouTube. Uh, okay, so George was asking. Okay, okay. So I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much for uh, being part of the Arithmetic family. If this is your first time, please do visit us uh, every Friday. Uh, we do this every Friday with different topics and uh, have a great uh, rest of the week. I mean, the week is uh, ended. Have a great weekend as well. Uh, stay safe and we'll meet again, God willing, next week, same time. For everybody else in uh, any of the trainings, we'll meet during the week next week. All right. All right, everyone. Have a great one. Uh, we'll meet again next week. Bye-bye, Sure. Thank you.